multi-jurisdictional, sophisticated campaign work that really is trying to change government systems at multiple levels. Um, I want to close just close my remarks by stating that youth organizing groups have been a have played a critical role in not only politicizing young people from immigrant backgrounds, including the children of undocumented young people, I mean, the children of undocumented immigrants, so US born second generation youth. Um, they've been a space that has allowed young people to heal from the trauma of our broken immigration systems, our broken and racist policing systems and so forth. So, um, it, and it's also been a space to process what it means to live in the United States without papers, as well as to be or the children of um, undocumented immigrants. Um, but it's also, these spaces have given young people the hope to fight for change at multiple levels. Thank you. So I'm gonna hand it over to the next speaker. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Tariquez. Um, and thank you for just setting the framework of how sophisticated and robust um, youth organizations that are focusing on immigration, how many fronts they're up against, right? How, how their purview has to be so widened because it impacts every aspect of an undocumented family, person, student's life. Um, so yeah, with that said, I, I would like to pass it over um, to uh, Connecticut Students for a Dream which is uh, Katia and Bridges to kind of lay some, some of the, you know, put some meat to the bones of like what we're talking about and the work that they're doing in Connecticut. So I'll go ahead and pass it over to them. Thank you, JMO. Thank you, everyone. I'm so sorry, you know, multi-generational family household here. So <laughs> you're gonna see people walking around. Um, so yeah, so I just want to introduce again myself. I'm Katia Daly, um, and I'm here with Bridget, uh, representing Connecticut Students for a Dream. And you are, and we're one of the statewide uh, youth-led networks fighting for the rights of undocumented youth and their families here in Connecticut. And whether we're organizing in the streets, uh, clearing pathways to education, and fighting for education equity, um, stopping deportations from our friends and families here in Connecticut, running advocacy campaigns to win legislations around healthcare access and education access as well, or creating alliances across social movements with the abolition uh, movement as well. The organization was actually founded with the leadership of two twins in 2010 and like just talking about the DREAM Act and the conversation around how um, immigration has become a spotlight in the, in the last decade. Um, this is where C4D started, right? Um, they saw an opportunity to create community around this issue and they were able to garner support from other members of the community and started organizing and advocating for our institutional aid campaign, which would um, uh, expand access to um, uh, scholarships and financial aid for our undocumented students um, uh, when applying to state universities. Uh, and through these 10 years, we have been driven by the priorities and needs of our members and communities. So we have trained and we have trained hundreds of individuals, educators and students and, um, and have worked with and support countless local youth organizing groups and campaigns through our different organizing strategies. Um, I'm gonna actually pass it to Bridget to talk about one of our most powerful strategies. Hi everyone, thank you, Katya. Um, so as Katya has stated before, you know, we are a youth-led organization and we are very much grassroots. Our work mostly centers on empowering youth, collective organizing and taking control of our narrative um, it is our youth who wanted to make the change in our community, so they took control of their power and implemented structures they wanted to see. And now we just continue to empower youth by allowing them the space to process and be creative in the forms that they advocate for social and institutional change. We believe in having the most vulnerable people affected in the fight at the forefront because it is through their um, experiences, we understand the real issue at hand and we try to come up with intersectional approaches for various issues. You know, we believe in the power of community as well. We know that community takes care of each other. 
So we are committed to international solidarity and understand that our immigrant community will not be free until liberation for various other marginalized communities, colonized communities, displaced communities is obtained. And lastly, I think most importantly, you know, our work also centers on the power of storytelling. You know, our youth members use this, use their experiences to push for both social change and institutional change. There is power in our testimonies and in our lived experiences. Um, so then it is used as a key component in various, in all of our fights, you know, fighting for educational equity, access to healthcare, abolition, um, of police and prisons. And, you know, I lastly, I just wanted to share with you uh, just one of our favorite chants because we do have a lot of rallies in which youth themselves organize and speak to um, and share their own stories in, uh, which is, you know, it is our duty to fight. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and take care of each other. And we have nothing to lose but our chains. As Shadow Shakur. Shakur. Yeah, and that's us. Thank you. Big shout out to uh, Connecticut students for a dream, C4D. Um, so yeah, I definitely love to, to pass it on to New Mexico Dream Team, another statewide um, network doing amazing work in New Mexico. So that's Eduardo and Felipe. Hey everyone, I'm Felipe. Um, I work as one of the co-directors of NMDT. Um, I joined the organization when I was uh, my first semester of college, undocumented and trying to figure out um, a lot of things. And I fell in love with organizing and with the organization. And um, I've been here since then, five, year, five years later, and after a lot of roles, uh, now um, serving the organization in this role. Our organization um, started um, in different parts of the state with different pockets of activism in the early 2000s um, that was very much uh, following the movement to pass the DREAM Act um, back then. And um, we were able to consolidate and form the statewide network um, formally in, in 2014. Um, and during that time, we also did um, a um, we partnered with the University of New Mexico to do a study um, um, that was led by undocumented youth um, for undocumented youth, looking at the things that are making. Um, we saw that a lot of our, a lot of the people in our organization were suffering from depression and um, high anxiety, uh, among other things, and we wanted to know why. Um, we found out that. The main factors were um, fear of deportation, uh, no access to healthcare, and no access to school um, or to higher education. And so I was reminded of that when Veronica showed the slide that um, that showed the the main focus is on on organizations across the country, um, and that told us that you know we're not just undocumented young people. Um, that's not our entire identity but we are um, people of color that, that can suffer um, racial violence. We are students um, that um, in our specific case is harder to get into school, um, but it's not only the immigration status, it's also poverty, um, um, not having connections, et cetera. And we're people that can get sick sometimes and need to go to the hospital. And if we cannot do that, life gets really hard. Um, and so from that, we developed kind of like our policy platform um, and started politicizing um, our membership past the, the stage of, of like, you know, activism and fighting for the Dream Act, but, but picking up local campaigns that could make a tangible difference in, in the lives so, of uh, for young people. Um, now um, we're, um, we have over 20 chapters on 20 different schools across the state of New Mexico. It's still very important for us to focus in grassroots organizing and leadership development. Um, and, but we also work on policy advocacy, civic engagement, um, and 
we still do activism and actions every now and then. <laughs> um, but now more as part of a campaign. Um, I think Eduardo wanted to highlight a couple of more points, so I'll pass it to him. The only thing I wanted to highlight is that for us, it was very important to establish ourselves as our own organization because the immigrant rights world looked didn't look like us. It was actually ran by white people that were not youth. And so um, we didn't want people to speak for us. And instead, we wanted to organize on our own behalf. And so that's always been a core uh, foundational aspect of, of our organization. We wanted to move away from that saver mentality of others and instead um, like I mentioned, uh, advocate on behalf of ourselves. And, and now, you know, a lot of our fighting is, like people have mentioned before, it's multi-issued. You know, we um, are drawing upon our connections to other uh, oppressed populations. Um, and currently, you know, we're gearing up to continue our fight against the uh, prisons and detention centers. Ah, thank you everyone for just laying some, some groundwork and some opening uh, to conversations. And so we want to engage the folks here um, with us um, and, and ask if there's any questions or anything you'd like to contribute to the conversation. It, I know that this issue sits on, on all of us, not just some of us. And so, um, yeah, I just want to open it up if there's any questions or any comments, what resonated with you, um, and feel free to, to come, off, uh, come off mute. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump off. Um, I appreciate people naming sort of like the history. I think it's it's somewhat, com it's believable, but also comical to think that there was a time where the folks leading this movement were like, you know, white liberal folks who were, for, who were removed from the issue. So um, kind of in that, you know, we also know that there's sort of just still a long way to go. Like there's still sort of challenges that are happening in the movement. And just curious uh, for folks on this call, uh, how you, how to, how are you thinking about the future of your organization? What is your vision for uh, just like a broader society, and kind of what do you aspire? That's a big question, but you know, what what do you all see? What do you want society to look like? You know, 10, 15 years from now. That's a very loaded question in so many aspects. Um, at least uh, for CPRD, we are actually going through a visioning process um, because we, our name even is as Connecticut Students for a Dream. And we're trying to change the narrative into the, the dreamer narrative to making sure that we are implementing our that conversation and our advocacy to our family members. Like all uh, the people that started this are not young adults anymore. Um, so we want to make sure that we're inclusive of all the generations. Um, we also want to make sure that um, how we expand is more in quality over in quantity because when we work on things, we know that there's different ways things that need to be worked on and it's very important that we acknowledge that but at the same time we also need to acknowledge our capacity and our mental health there has there is burnout in in organizing and we need to be very careful on on where we expand or um we are all creating uh, amazing change in the world now but we also need to take care of ourselves for this to continue for years for years to come so those are some of the thoughts that i have I just wanted to comment on Felipe's comment on the chat. He said, hopefully we'll be out of a job. That's also like in a real envisioning period, the end goal is to have a society where nonprofit organizations are not needed, you know, and all is, all is oh well, and you know, we can all take care of each other. Uh, definitely. Um, I think a lot of the work in the meantime is going to break down all the divisions that have sprouted up. You know, um, the DREAM Act created a lot of divisions within our community. DACA created a lot of divisions within our community. So, you know, we're trying to break those down within the community and then um, connect with others. For us, um, it's been one of our priorities to connect with the indigenous population of our state um, as we do our own internal work, because a lot of us have um, 
you know, denounced our indigenous roots or have been forcibly separated from our indigenous roots. So that's very important uh, for us as displaced people to connect with the original stewards of this land that we are in. Um, and then additionally, just the full understanding that everything that is done to us, especially when we are uh, non-Black, has been first and foremost done to Indigenous people and Black people in this country. And so continuing to build solidarity and also understanding ourselves uh, deeper than just our immigration status, because you know we want to get citizenship for everybody. But once we get there, um, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done to get to the society we want to live in. Um, so we want to continue understanding ourselves as complex people. Uh, also, in the meantime, uh, before we uh, don't have a job anymore, I think for us in New Mexico, the two biggest uh, villains are the oil and gas industry and the private detention industry, um, private prisons and private immigrant detention centers. Um, those two industries dominate the state, um, have the most power out of um, an institution um, and are really hurting of, or people in, in many levels, hurting um, immigrants, hurting New, Me uh, New Mexicans um, and um, keeping our state in poverty and under a lot of violence. And so I, we really envision a, you know, a future where we transition out of those industries um into um renewable air industries that are healthy to our communities uh, to the planet and uh, treat workers um with with respect and dignity um, i see in the chat we uh thank you all for answering i see in the chat uh deborah asked uh what have been your challenges with fundraising I'll kick it to uh, New Mexico Dream Team first and then CD4, C4D. I think um, probably the most common challenge is getting long-term uh, continuous funding for general support. People always want the most innovative, brand new, campaign or program or something when sometimes we just need to build our infrastructure and focus on the leaders we have um, and not always be following such a crazy growth or unreasonable innovation expectations when um, a lot of the stuff that you know all of us here do is already very uh, at a very big contrast to you know everyday mainstream regular life in the US. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what I think. Um, for C4D, um, I mean, I'm not um, very much uh, like attend to our our grants and things like that for funding and things. But similar to, to what Eduardo was saying is that uh, continuous funding and funding that doesn't have any strings attached is very important and very scarce for us. Um, again, with that idea of, you know, the mentality of having the to expand more, to get more funding, we, we need to, as, as Eduardo said, like literally the same thing is that uh, we need to focus on our leaders. We need to make sure that they're well. And just going back to our conversation, my, that my comment around burnout and capacity, um, it's very much important for us to take care of what we have and uh, how we can make sure that the members that we are uh, accountable for are taken care of um, in different ways. Well, thank, you. thank you for that. Awesome. And then uh, also, uh, Grisanti put in, in the chat, um, and I believe, uh, Katia, you spoke a little bit to this expanding the narrative, right? And I think, um, especially around like immigration. Um, so I know you, you spoke about like DREAM, uh, the DREAM Act. What about like immigration itself and expanding that narrative beyond the Latinx uh, community? And then, Eduardo, I know you mentioned a little bit about um, abolition work and what that looks like within immigration. So do you all want to expand on on those two? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, when we were trying to, when I was starting to talk about changing the narrative um, in, in making sure that we're all working for, as, as Bridget also stated, like the liberation of everyone. Um, our work is not gonna be done until that happens. Um, that can shape in different forms. And it has the, the different ways on how the government has put like different things like Dream Act or DACA has definitely had the vision within our communities. Um, but we are looking beyond that, right? Um, if, if we get citizenship with the Biden administration, which I don't think it's going to happen. Um, what happens to the undocumented folks that come a day after, right? Um, there's going to still be this, uh, the, the immigration system is still broken. Um, we need to make sure that that whoever is coming behind us is able, to, we are able to take care for them. And that's where our healthcare, healthcare for, um, healthcare access for our undocumented community here in Connecticut, we are fighting for that so that even if, me or the or organizers that built this campaign have citizenship, then those folks that are coming be, uh, behind have access to healthcare, um, affordable healthcare, quality of healthcare. Um, but, um, and just, this is some of my thoughts. In terms of that, this is very important for all of us to understand that all Policing um, is is the same thing, and all incarceration is is the same thing. Uh, we these systems have never served us, and will never serve us in any positive way. Um, they're used as a way to make profit off of us, um, and so it's really important to understand safety um, as something that does not require law enforcement. In fact, the opposite. Um, and so, you know, for us, CBP, ICE, and local police departments and sheriff's departments are all part of the same thing. And so understanding that will, I think, move us all forward and, again, be part of that unification between our communities. Because um, folks understand, are understanding more and more police brutality at the hands of local law enforcement. Uh, we must also understand that it's the same thing as ICE abuse and CBP abuse. Um, and so with that, we need to get rid of incarceration because um, it's a, an extractive economy, but it's extracting upon our lives to build profit. Um, just like oil and gas and fossil fuels, it's, it's all the same extractive colonizing model. Yeah, and so with the few seconds left, I just really wanna ground us that uh, undocumented youth are leading this intersectional abolition framework. And thank you all for joining our small group. I know we're about to leave uh, this group, but I'll see you in the big room. All right, welcome back everyone. I don't know if your groups were like ours where uh, somebody was breaking down some serious knowledge when we were all forced back into this group. Uh, gotta love those Zoom timers that force us back. I, I hope your groups were as engaging. I know that uh, CO and KG were, were really breaking it down in our group. Um, so a lot of appreciation to everybody for all of the wisdom that you shared um, and uh, know that this uh, won't be the last space that we have to continue to connect and build and share and learn lessons with each other. Um, so um, as we move towards closing out today, um, you know, CO mentioned in the overview is that the final section of, of the field scan is called the future of youth power. And it takes a look at the progress challenges and vision forward that we heard from youth organizers and young people who are doing this work on the ground. Um, and, uh, you know, I encourage you to read the report, but rather than doing that now and hitting the findings, we wanted to invite a youth organizer to come and talk about where we are, um, what we've learned, and the vision for the role of young people in advancing movements for social justice in this really critical moment. And I can think of nobody better to do that than James Lopez. Um, James is a native of Rochester, New York and now the executive director of the Power U Center for Social Change in Miami. He's an alum 
of Black Organizing for Leadership and Dignity Directors Training and a member of FCYO's Board Executive Committee. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to James to share some of your reflections and thoughts on the future of youth power. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces and names I haven't seen in a minute. Um, just really grateful and humbled to be having this conversation and to sort of talk a little bit about what a vision or future of youth organizing may look like. Um, it feels super right for me because, um, as Eric mentioned, I'm from a uh, place, Rochester, New York, uh, and then I kind of cut my teeth in organizing in Buffalo, New York, where there was no youth organizing organization. Uh, if you were a young person, you were kind of stuck in a, a so-called adult organizing group, and you were the young person uh, who had potentially super idealistic ideas of what the future should look like, uh, and, you know, you tried to build with the adults. Um, and... Uh, it's funny to know that now working with Power You and youth organizing, I promise you, although people don't really like to admit it, a lot of the issues that happened in so-called adult organizing are very similar, almost the exact same uh, as issues that happen organizationally, youth organizing. So uh, when people say youth organizing is fundamentally different, uh, that has not been my experience. Um, but it's also been really helpful for me uh, in the context of the decades of this work. Uh, when I first joined Power You, uh, my ability to really be grounded in the purpose of uh, young people in history and youth organizing has come from uh, my predecessors at Power U. It came from people who've been doing the work that I was able to pick up the phone and call and say, hey, what have you all been doing for the past couple of years? What's worked? What hasn't worked? Um, and really just sort of, it was the culture, it was the community of youth organizing, uh, groups like AEJ, uh, like FreeSync, that really helped me get my bearings. And why that's important for me is because, you know, one of the things that is uh, sort of scary, but also an opportunity in this moment is that we know our political future is very uncertain. Uh, so for us, we know that uh, there is an economic downturn that is coming. It's going to affect our families. We don't know how. Uh, we also know that the 